It was a beautiful summer's day. A little girl decided that she was going to go out into her garden and play. When she got into the garden, she looked around, and all of a sudden her little eyes caught sight of a little creature. The little creature was a Lepidoptera. Now you all know what that is, don't you? Remember we said on Tuesday, what is it? Just shout it out. Well, that was a bit of a mumble, wasn't it? <laughs> a butterfly or a moth, that's right. Can I just ask you, how many of you here tonight have actually cut a moth or a butterfly in your hands? Put your hands up if you have. Nearly everyone. When you let it go, what did you notice was on your hands? Dust? Well, that's what it looks like, doesn't it? But if you were to put that dust under a microscope, it's not dust at all. In actual fact, it is little tiny, come on, scales. In actual fact, you'll notice they've actually been puffed up. They're little pockets of air, and these are actually hooked uh, to the upper and, well, beneath the, the wing of the moth or the butterfly. Amazing little creatures and uh, if you just think about the word lepidoptera it comes from two greek words now, the first word is lepis which means scale and the other word is teron wing scaled wings so what you've actually removed from the wing of a moth or a butterfly are its little scales, you cruel lot, you. <laughs> so I just thought uh, that word lepidoptera helps us to understand really what is meant. But if you look at the uh, a moth or a butterfly, and there are a tremendous variety, aren't there, of uh, patterns, which are made up with these little tiny scales. Sometimes you notice with the wings, they're different shapes as well. But beautiful, and they really do enhance... Uh, Jehovah's creation. Who of us maybe isn't amazed? Maybe when you look at one close up and uh, you can see its intricate design on its wings and uh, the shape of the wings and the fact that this uh, plays an important part, doesn't it, in the ecosystems of the earth today? Well, they are amazing creatures uh, because when you look at um, a moth or a butterfly up close, uh, you'll notice that it um, has different sections, doesn't it, to the body. Uh, the top section, of course, the head, and on the head what you have is two very large compound eyes which can actually see in panoramic vision and in full colour. And on its head you also notice it's got two, not as one sister said, antlers. <laughs> what do we call them? Antennae. Anybody know what the antennae are for? They're not for eating. <laughs> Please, come on then. Let's have uh, Sister Nancy Seeger. They can detect scent with them. You're right. The so names of the... Go on. Is it sex? <laughs> well done, yes. In fact, is it um, one... Uh, the species that can actually detect a female up to seven miles away. Now just imagine if humans had to have antennae to locate a mate. Ooh! <laughs> eh? Now when you think about the antennae, how can you tell the difference between the moth and the butterfly? Yes, please, Sister Julie. The butterfly has a knobbly bit on the end and the moth doesn't. A knobbly bit on the end? Yeah. <laughs> Well, you're quite right, doesn't it? With the moth, they tend to be more feathered, don't they? Although, having said that, that's not strictly true with every species. In fact, if you just think about uh, how many species there are, I think it's Grzymek actually says there's something between 150 and 200,000 species. Another encyclopedia of insects says there could be up to 200,000. Now, I don't know why you can get such a vast difference by saying between 150 and 200,000. Uh, and the real story behind that is that nobody actually knows just how many species there are. In fact, it seems that every year goes by, a new one seems to be being discovered. 
But they are amazing, absolutely amazing. But you can tell the difference just by looking, generally speaking, at the uh, antennae. Well, of course, you have the antennae, then you've got these two large compound eyes, and then underneath the head, you have something else. Anybody know what that is? It looks like a coiled spring. All right, uh, please, Brother Alan. The thorax. A what, sorry? Thorax. Uh, the thorax is the next section of the body. I'm talking about underneath the head. We'll come back to that in a minute. Well done. Let's have Brother Fred in the foyer. That's his tongue, and it's a little bit longer than his own body. It's his tongue. Anybody know what it's called? Okay, let's have, uh, uh, please, Brother Paul. It's a proboscis. Well done. And you're one of the few that have actually pronounced it correctly. Mary's face going, ooh. <laughs> okay, so proboscis. In actual fact, when it lands on a food source, which is another reason why it's got this antennae, because it, it can locate food with it as well. And this will actually begin to uncoil and begin to sip its nectar and so on. Well, let's just come back to the next bit that um, Brother mentioned just now, the thorax. Now, on the thorax, uh, you've actually got attached to it its wings. How many wings has it got? All together? Four. And also its legs. How many legs has it got? Six. Is it six? Hey. It just uh, tells us how much homework you've done, but it has got six. And what do you notice about its legs? Can you tell us about what it's on its legs? Three on each side. Pardon? Three on each side. Four on each side? Three on each side. Three on each side. Well, that's true, but what do you notice about its legs? They've got hairy legs. Why have they got hairy legs? <laughs> Come on then, our little sister here, she could tell us. For the pollen. For pollen? Well, that's true, it will pick up pollen on its hairy legs but also aids it with sound. Okay, interesting that, isn't it? I hope you're taking a note of all these little details because there is a written exam before you leave tonight. <laughs> Some of you are looking a bit pale now. <laughs> okay, uh, anybody know where their taste buds are? Well, I can tell some have done some homework. Well, let's have our brother, then he's going to have a go. Is it Lewis, please? Is it the feet? Well done, very good. Make sure mum gives you double pocket money this week, all right? <laughs> yeah, taste buds are on its feet. And they reckon, don't they, with um, one particular species, I think it's a North American monarch, its uh, taste buds are said to be 2,000 times more sensitive than that of the human tongue. Absolutely incredible. Well, just imagine if you had your taste buds on your feet. Oh, cheese. <laughs> That's all right, it's called the imagination of some there, I can see. All right, okay. But that's an amazing thing, is it? Taste buds on their feet. And we know that because when it lands on uh, its food source, sometimes that's where the proboscis begins to open up. Okay, well done. That brings you down then to the abdomen. In the abdomen, what you have uh, embodied there, because that's a nice expression, is it embodied? Uh, it's uh, digestive and reproductive organs. Now, if you look down the uh, main section of the abdomen, you'll notice there are little holes going down the length of the abdomen. Anybody know what they're called? Oh, we got one, two. All right, let's have Sister Julie, please. This is 30-year-old O-level biology. I think they're called spiracles. Excellent. And what are they for? Um, breathing. Excellent. Well, is that what you were going to say, Paul? even if it was wrong. <laughs> no, but he did know, I'm sure. Well done, that's good. So, an amazing little creature, aren't they? Because when you begin to look at uh, the makeup of the, the Lepidoptera, uh, they didn't start out looking like that beautiful red admiral or uh, a monarch or uh, maybe one of these painted ladies that's been in the news this last week. There are thousands of them, aren't there? Uh, laying all these eggs, was it about 300 at a time? Uh, they didn't start out life like that. Anybody know how they started out life? Okay, could we have uh, Sister Margaret, please? A female lays an egg and the egg grows into a caterpillar. 
All right, well, let's just take the egg. Anybody know how long they take to hatch out? Well, again, I suppose that would take too long to answer because depending on the species and whether or not you've got the right conditions depends on how long it would take to hatch out. Um, sometimes if an egg is laid, say, towards the uh, fall of the year, they will actually remain like that until the following spring onwards where the temperature has arrived. In actual fact, for this process... Uh, this transformation to take place through the various uh, series uh, there, it needs uh, three things. It needs moisture, it needs light, and it also needs to have warmth. Okay, just bear those in mind. You'll see the point of all this a little bit later on. But anyway, when the egg hatches out, the first thing this little creature does uh, the larva, or we could say the caterpillar, it eats the eggshell. And because the egg invariably has been attached to a food source or very near to one, it now begins to devour uh, the food source. Absolutely amazing. In fact, these little creatures are greedy little things. They eat, and they eat, and they eat, until what happens? Don't say they go pop. <laughs> what happens? They eat and they eat and they eat. Please, Brother David. David Jones, that's it. They grow big and then split and grow big again. Second time, third time, fourth oh, time. Yeah. Well done. So they actually shed their skins. They molt. Uh, anybody know what they call the molts? They call them instars. Oh, is that what you want to say? Is that right? That's right. Well done. Good. And how many times do they might all together then? Or maybe even four or five? Okay. Well done. That's good. Now, bear in mind all these little features because they are relevant. Okay. And as I say, there is a written exam at the end. Okay. So this little creature then uh, eats and eats and eats. It sheds its skin. Now, it is said by one particular butterfly specialist um, that if you had a six pound baby that ate and grew at the same rate as a caterpillar after two weeks it would tip the scales at eight tons now you want a big pram for that wouldn't you <laughs> but isn't that amazing you see but it's once it's finished, those particular molts, those uh, instars, then all that uh, eating ceases. And what's the next stage? What begins to happen next? What's the next stage? Please. All right, let's have our little flower here. Chrysalis. All right, so chrysalis, if it's a butterfly, what do we call it if it's a moth? All right, brother... Oh, no, let's have our little sister there. Sorry, Paul. Cocoon. Excellent. Well done. You can have double pocket money as well. All right. <laughs> okay, that's true. So it's an amazing thing, isn't it? Because it's ectomorphic, it actually breaks down, doesn't it? The whole body begins to break. If you were to open it up, and it just looks like a green mush inside, wouldn't it suggest that you actually do that because you're killing off, aren't you? Sort of a beautiful little creature. Uh, but eventually, and again, providing you've got the, the lights, the warmth, and uh, what did I say, light, warmth, and moisture, uh, then, of course, it will begin to hatch out. And again, depending upon the time of year and depending on the kind of, or well, the species as well. But what you'll notice is that before it actually hatches out, uh, this whole thing begins to move. It moves, I know, because when I was a lad, we used to chase the girls with them. He would say, look at that, and then all of a sudden it would go, Ooh! and off they'd run, and we'd run after them and put them down their necks. I was the only one, wasn't I? No. <laughs> anyway, but something vitally important is taking place at that stage, because what it's actually doing, this struggle that seems to be going on within this uh, chrysalis or this cocoon, is vital to the next stage of the life cycle. And what it's doing is beginning to pump fluids into little tiny veins in the wings now, eventually, when it breaks out of the cocoon or the chrysalis, it doesn't look particularly a pretty sight. It's all wet, it's all bedraggled, 
And what it needs to do is for its wings to spread. And again, even that process, once it's emerged, it's still pumping fluids. But then, of course, the wings will harden off. And if you've got the right temperature as well, it will now begin to take off. It will fly. The next, uh, well, part of the life cycle begins after that. But amazing little creatures. And, uh, of course, you'll find them all over the world. You'll find them scaling the dizzy heights of the Himalayas at 20,000 feet. You find them 100 feet below sea level in the Middle East. You'll even find 46 species in the frigid tundra of the Arctic Circle. 20% of the world species are said to be in Peru. And when you look at the different kinds of moths and butterflies, and some say that it's just the butterflies which are beautiful, that's not true. Moths are also very beautiful, very vivid in colours and patterns on their wings and so on. They're equally as beautiful. Now again, generally speaking, we think about a moth, people tend to think of moth, don't they, when they put their clothes in a cupboard and they... They don't want moths to come along and eat their clothes. But it's not the actual moth that actually eats your clothes. Did you know that? It's not a moth that eats it. It's the little caterpillar that eats your clothes. It will actually eat wool, silk, even fur. So there we are. Amazing creatures. In fact, some of these, uh, you'll notice they differ in size as well. If you had the Brophidium exilis, the pygmy blue of North America, that has a wingspan of just less than half an inch. Now compare that with the Ornithoptera alexandrae, the Queen Alexander birdwing of the South Pacific. That can have a wingspan of some 10 inches. But then you might want to go to India and actually see the giant atlas moth, which can have a wingspan up to 12 inches. These are absolutely amazing creatures. And some do really have some very vivid colours. And there's a good reason for that. Anybody know why? Because some of these are actually poisonous. And really what it's telling is any predator, keep away from me, you'll die. But then others uh, have the ability to camouflage themselves. In fact, I saw a program just recently where you had some of these which actually blended in on the bark of a tree. In fact, photographs have been taken. You'd have a job to pick out uh, this particular species from the bark. Others have patterns. Now, it's as big as I can get it, so if you sit right at the back, you won't see this. But what I will do is I'll pass this round. Please don't tear it or crumple it. And if you can come back down to the end here, you can have a look at it. But if I just show you that, what do you notice on the wings? Looks like of a snake. Can you see that? Yeah. Now again, that is to protect it from predators. If you'd like to just pass that along and then onto the other side when it reaches the back, I'd be grateful. Okay. But they are amazing creatures. In fact, uh, there are some, uh, we mentioned about 46 species, that managed to survive in the frigid tundra of the Arctic Circle. And it's almost as though some of these have got like an antifreeze in their body, which stops them actually freezing, allows them to continue in their particular life cycles. Uh, so they are amazing creatures, absolutely beautiful. And the more you look at them, the more you begin to see Jehovah's wonderful creative qualities, uh, beautiful designs. In actual fact, if you think about the Sphinx moth, or they can actually just hover, just like a hummingbird. Uh, we think about flight of some of these. One in this country was actually followed by a helicopter. 136.7 miles in 4 hours and 42 minutes. Amazing flight. Some you probably read about in our magazines, they can migrate a 1,000 miles. You know, they don't have, do they... You know, these huge fuel tanks, like you see on aircraft, to be able to travel these vast different distances. Uh, so again, it helps you to see, doesn't it, Jehovah's amazing creative ability. But then, of course, when we think about uh, Jehovah's creation, there is something which is far more beautiful than a butterfly or a moth. And that is the transformation that takes place in a human. 
once they come to know the truth. Now, can you remember the word, what's the word that's used for the transformation of the moth or the butterfly? Brother David, please. Metamorphosis. Well done. Very good. Now, let's have a look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Now, the Apostle Paul says in his letter to the Roman Christians, uh, well, let's pick it up in verse 1. He says, Consequently, I entreat you by the compassion of God, brothers, to present your bodies a sacrifice living, holy, acceptable to God, a sacred service with your power of reason. Now, we'll just stop there for a minute. Can you see what he's saying? That we need to present our bodies to God like a living sacrifice. Now, we're not talking about a dead sacrifice that was offered up, say, under the Mosaic law all those years ago. No, but our whole life, the way we present our bodies to be like a living sacrifice. And just as with the sacrifices that were offered up in uh, ancient Israel, they had to be of the very best, didn't they? The highest quality. Uh, Jehovah would not accept, he would not have his approval if we offered up an inferior uh, sacrifice. No. So it needs to be of the very best. Now, in verse 2, Paul goes on to say, and quit being fashioned after this system of things, but then he says, be transformed by making your mind over that you may prove to yourselves the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, that word transform in the Greek language, I'm sure you all know, it's the word metamorpho, from which we get the English word metamorphosis, isn't it? That's right. So can you see what he's encouraging us to do? Uh, he's saying be transformed, but we need to make our mind up. We need to be conscious of making the changes. And that's why, if we have a look at uh, Colossians chapter 3, you can see the significance of some of the details that we brought out about the Lepidoptera. Uh, Colossians 3, and if we just go down to verse 9. So again, the Apostle Paul, after saying, do not be lying to one another, and here's the real point. He says, strip off the old personality with its practices and clothe yourselves with the new personality which through accurate knowledge is being made new, according to the image of the one who created it. Now, can you remember what we said with the caterpillar, uh, that little grub? Uh, how many times does it shed its skin? Come on, please, Brother Robert. Four or five times. Now, we're not suggesting there are just four or five things that we need to change in our lives. Now, this is an ongoing process, isn't it? Uh, as we begin to learn what God's will and purpose is, what his requirements are of us as individuals, then we begin to make the changes, the adjustments in our lives. Uh, in fact, this is ongoing. In fact, we will not complete our spiritual metamorphosis until when? Please, Brother Jeff. Absolutely. But we're still beautiful in his eyes, in Jehovah's eyes, and he knows that we're going on, making this transformation, this spiritual metamorphosis is taking place with each and every one of us. As we come to a meeting, or as we study God's word, maybe we do some research, maybe we come to think, well, hang on a minute, I'm not doing that. Or that's wrong thinking. Or that conduct is out of harmony with God's will and purpose. So we start to make the changes. In fact, probably for most here this evening, when you started to learn what the truth was all about, what God's requirements were, maybe you made a lot of rapid adjustments to begin with. Maybe you quit smoking. Uh, maybe the person you were living with you're not married to. Uh, maybe you had a violent disposition. Whatever. But we made those changes, and we continue to make those changes, don't we? In fact, you just think about uh, some back in Bible times, some of the changes that they had to make back then. Well, let's just have a look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, I know you know this passage very well indeed, and perhaps many of you actually quote it uh, in the ministry, or when you're teaching somebody the truth. So 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and if we just go down to verse 9, uh, the Apostle Paul starts off. He says, what? 
Do you not know that unrighteous persons will not inherit God's kingdom? And then he says, do not be misled. And then goes on to list the kind of practices that do not have God's approval. He says, neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, nor men kept for unnatural purposes, nor men who lie with men, nor thieves, greedy persons, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, will inherit God's kingdom. Now just think about that. Those back then in the first century were practices of these things. Now can you imagine that? You know, some were homosexuals, adulterers, idolaters, involved in gross misconduct weren't they and then what does Paul say in verse 11 and yet so they made they had to change their thinking their attitude didn't they and then put away the old personality with its practices and continue to work hard to put on a Christ-like personality that took a lot of effort I always think of that one, there's a passage, I don't know if you ever noticed this, in Titus chapter 3, uh, just a little bit further on. I always think this is amazing because it's the Apostle Paul and he's writing to Titus. But look at the admission he makes here in verse 3. And notice he says, for even we. So Paul, writing to Timothy, includes Titus, doesn't he? And he says, for even we were once senseless disobedient, being misled, being slaves of various desires and pleasures, carrying on in badness, envy, abhorrent, hating one another. <laughs> now you can't imagine that, can you really? Uh, these ones who are eventually going to make up the heavenly government of 144,000, they're going to be with Christ, aren't they? Now just imagine what a tremendous privilege is, what a great honour to be able to serve Jehovah God in that capacity. But in order to qualify, they really did have to make a lot of changes, didn't they? It was an ongoing situation. So, absolutely amazing. I thought what we might do, just for a few minutes, is just look at one particular individual in a little bit more depth. Just go back to Luke chapter 19. Luke 19, and we'll just pick it up from verse 1. It says, and he, that is Jesus, entered Jericho and was going through. Now, I don't know if you know, but back in Jesus' day, there were actually two Jerichos. Uh, there was the older Jewish city. About a mile away uh, was the new Roman city. Both of them were about a day's journey from Jerusalem. So Jesus is going through. Now, as they're going through, you notice in verse 2, it says, now here... There was a man called by the name Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector, and then it tells us he was rich. Now let's just pause there for a minute. It doesn't say he was just a tax collector, it says he was a chief tax collector. Now for somebody to gain the rights to collect taxes back in Jesus' day, uh, they would have to, had to have bought by auction the rights to collect taxes in a particular area. Now, he'd obviously paid quite a sum for this, but he gets the rights to collect taxes in and around where he's living. Now, Jericho, uh, it was a verdant area. It was, well, like they might say in Bristol, girt lush. <laughs> All right, it was, no, it was ideal for the growing of fruits and grain. It was rich pickings, for taxes. Now, if you just think about this man, he's obviously quite an entrepreneur because now he hires other men and they're now going to be collecting taxes on his behalf and no doubt creaming off a percentage and no doubt he becomes a very wealthy man. Now, I don't know about you, but a wealthy man, he would have probably enjoyed the best that life had to offer. Uh, he'd have had the finest of foods, the finest of clothes. So he'd have been very finely dressed. It probably, I always picture Zacchaeus as maybe living in one of these sort of Roman villas, you know, with the pantile roofs, white walls. Maybe it's a, a walled property. He's probably got servants. I can just imagine him just laying out in his hammock and just gesturing to one of his minions to peel him another grape. 
And then there he is, having a luxurious lifestyle. And one day, there's quite a commotion outside his villa. So he sends off one of his servants to find out what's going on. The servant rushes back and he says, well, there's a crowd. And they say that Jesus of Nazareth is with him, with them. Well, he wants to see who this Jesus is. Maybe you already know something about Jesus, heard about him, his teachings, the fact that he performs miracles. But then he goes outside and there's this crowd. And you can just imagine how the crowd would feel on seeing Zacchaeus. You see, because tax collectors, the collectors they were hated. They were looked upon with disdain by uh, the population. You see, because these fraternized with the enemy, the Romans. And then they were generally a dishonest lot. So they were hated, they were looked down upon. Nobody wanted to be a friend of a tax collector. So anyway, he goes out and you can just imagine trying to see who this Jesus is. And probably just jumping up and down, but he can't see because he's got a problem. What was his problem? He was what? A titch. He's only got little legs. Now, he may be little, but he's not stupid. Notice what he does. It says, now, in verse 4, so he ran ahead to an advanced position and climbed a fig mulberry tree in order to see him, because he was about to go through that way. Now, he climbs a tree. How would he have been dressed? I know, he had his tree climbing clothes on, didn't he? No, he would have been dressed... In his grand, oh, very good. Anybody know what a fig mulberry tree is like? It's amazing. We read these accounts and so we don't ever stop and think about what we're reading. I tell you, it really does bring the account to life if you just look these things up. Please, Brother David. I believe they're quite thorny. Well, they were. In fact, some talk about the sycamore, don't they? But my bit of research shows it wasn't unlike the English oak. Some of them had, you know, quite big boughs. But if you notice on the bough of an oak tree, it has all these little spriggly bits, yeah, with the leaves and things. And you just imagine him now climbing up this tree and getting caught up with bits and pieces on his clothing. But there he is. He's sitting on the bough of this particular tree, and this crowd is coming towards him. How do you think he's feeling? He's in a very undignified Situation, And you can just imagine this crowd now. Once they spot him up a tree, hey, look, it's Zach, Zach up a tree. <laughs> and when they got close, what would they have been able to see? <laughs> Come on, what would they have been able to see? <laughs> oh, I know what's going through your mind. I'm thinking of his little hairy legs. <laughs> But isn't it amazing, you see, because Jesus gets to this point. And what does he do? Well, in verse 5, it says, Now, when Jesus got to the place, he looked up and said to him, Now, notice this, straight away he calls him Zacchaeus. Now, how did he know his name? Perhaps he already had gone by. Maybe the disciples had mentioned. Maybe he already knew. That was where Zacchaeus lived. I mean, he was a notorious character after all. But anyway, Zacchaeus, he says, Hurry and get down. You can just imagine Zacchaeus now, can't you, saying, Well, why don't you just call up here? And now he's got to get down. And he does. And it says, doesn't it, why he wanted to get down. He says, Because today I must stay in your house. Now, isn't that interesting? Today I'm going to stay in your house. Now, why is that interesting then? Well, I don't know. Let's take John and Lillian. I don't know whether you know this, but Eileen and I were going to come and stay in your house for a month. Is that all right? John's going. And she's going. <laughs> no, but if I just said that to you, you'd say, well, that's a bit of an imposition, wouldn't you? Well, you would, wouldn't you? Anybody would. And Jesus is just saying now, he's just invited himself to come and stay in Zacchaeus' home. 
But then obviously Jesus has a very good reason for doing this, you see. Now one thing we learn about Jesus, a little point for the ministry, Jesus was never ever blinkered when it came to the ministry. Obviously as this crowd is going along, Jesus being observant, and very astute, would have noticed this man, not walking, running ahead, now begins to climb a tree in his refined gear, and is willing to forego all the indignity of the occasion to sit there waiting for Jesus to come by. Now Jesus obviously sees something in this man, maybe it's a measure of humility, a willingness, a wanting to see Jesus. Can you see that? But anyway, Jesus has got something in mind. And it isn't just to go and, I don't know, lie out in a hammock and have somebody pour him out a glass of wine. No, he's there for a specific purpose. He wants to impart the truth to this man. And this is where it really begins to get interesting, because notice how the people feel, first of all. He gets down with rejoicing, but what do the people do in verse 7? It says, they all fell to muttering. Now, what's mutter? Don't say somebody who can't tell the difference between stalk and butter. All right? Muttering is what? Generally, isn't it moaning, complaining? Yes? In low tones, behind his back, they do not have the courage, do they, to come up and say, excuse me, Jesus, but don't you know who this man is? That's a kiss. He's a crook. He's a chief tax collector. He fraternizes with the enemy. Look, if you really need somewhere to stay, please, come and stay at my house. No, they don't do that. They just talk behind his back. But Jesus goes in, he stays with this man. He obviously gives him a powerful witness, because notice what happens in verse 8. It says, but Zacchaeus stood up. Now, from my little bit of research, in fact, in one particular commentary, it shows that this was like a public declaration, to stand up, a public declaration. And what does he say? Now, if there are people just listening to this, he actually says, to begin with, he says, the half of my belongings, Lord, I am giving to the poor. And you can just imagine the crowd now, can't you, with a sharp intake of breath. (gasps) Did you hear that? He's got to give half of his belongings to the poor. Now, just imagine I suggested to everybody here tonight, I want you to give me half of everything you've got. How would that leave you? Probably not with anything (laughs) much, really. Isn't it? Now, can you just imagine this man, maybe his villa, whatever, but half of his belongings he's now going to give to the poor. He's now going to live, hasn't he, with a very reduced lifestyle. But it doesn't stop there, does it? What does he say next? He said, and whatever I extorted. Now, can you imagine the crowd? The moment that he mentions the fact, confesses that he's an extortioner well that was a brave thing to do because he could have just been lynched couldn't he maybe from that fig mulberry tree no but notice what he says he says whatever I have extorted by false accusation I am restoring fourfold Now, if you had to look in the interlinear, and it's good sometimes, we're doing our Bible reading, particularly the Christian Greek scriptures, of course, uh, to read it from the interlinear. Because it doesn't use that expression. In the interlinear, it says, whatever I have extorted by fig showing. Fig showing. An interesting expression, because this enables us to get an insight into the character of this man Zacchaeus. The word originated in Athens. In fact, in Athens, if anybody exported figs from the province, that was a criminal offence. It was against the law. A person found doing so was called a fig shower. The etymology of the word change came to mean someone who was a malignant informer, a blackmailer, or as we've got here, an extortioner but you can extort in various ways. Now, when it says about a malignant informer, maybe we could just illustrate it this way. Well, I don't know. Uh, Let me see. Uh, Peter, now, last year, you earned an absolute fortune, didn't you? 
And uh, it's come to my attention, Peter, that you've been doing a bit of fig showing. You've been a naughty boy. I'll tell you what, Pete, because uh, I'm your mate, if you make it worth my while, I'll keep mum. Come on in. He pays me the money, and then I go and tell on him anyway. A malignant informer. Can you see? Uh, people that were actually called that, and he actually admits to this, doesn't he, that he was extorting by false accusation. Now, the other bit that's interesting is the fact that he says he's going to restore fourfold. Now, if you defrauded someone back in Bible times, you had to pay 120%. So whatever you'd taken, you defrauded, plus 20%. That's what the law said. He says, I'm going to restore fourfold. So he wasn't really required to do that. But it's almost as though he goes the extra mile. Uh, and really what it's to do with is to do with repentance. You see, if somebody's committed a gross sin against Jehovah and somebody says, well, well, I don't know, let's take an example in your congregation. You've got a brother, sets up a business, gets everybody to invest in it, and they all lose their money, hundreds of thousands of pounds. And the brother's brought before a judicial committee, and he weeps a bit, says, I'm ever so sorry. But he's still got his million and a half pounds uh, house down the road, a fleet of top-of-the-range cars, you know, the Lamborghini, the Porsche. I mean, is he, is he genuinely repentant? Is he? He's not, is he? In fact, with repentance, it says, doesn't it, a little quote uh, from the Insight books, it says that repentance always has to be commensurate with the deviation from Jehovah's standards. So you can't be a little bit repentant. You have to be really repentant. As you can just imagine this man now, he probably has got all his records, being a tax man, and uh, he would have known who he'd extorted monies from. So now he's going to pay it all back. Can you just imagine it? Probably, what's he got left? Probably next to nothing. But can you see what Jesus says in verse 9 in conclusion? At this Jesus said to him, this day has come to the, this day salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. Now what does that mean? It actually means uh, that he would actually become a member of the 144,000. Can you just imagine that? You know, he was now going to be storing up treasures in heaven, not on earth where moth and rust consume. What a wonderful privilege. You know, that eventually he would die, they'd be resurrected to the heavens. What does it say in Matthew 5? He'd even see the face of God. And there he would be, a king, a priest, a judge, wouldn't he? Tremendous privileges. Yes. All because he'd transformed from being the character he was, he now put on a Christ-like personality. He was willing to make the changes, the adjustments. Some of them, obviously, quite rapid weren't they? Yeah, but what a wonderful blessing that is. And that's really the encouragement for all of us. You know, the more we study, and we're certainly encouraged to do that now more than ever before, aren't we? To be a good student of God's word. To feed ourselves spiritually. Well, we're going to conclude with a lovely song, song 152, Appreciating God's Compassions. Principles which, when applied in our lives, uh, can not only keep us safe, secure, but can indeed enhance our lives. And uh, we know that we can be successful in whatever we do in your worship and service. So Jehovah, as we continue to avail ourselves of these uh, wonderful provisions to make adjustments in our thinking, our attitudes, our conduct, may we become ever more pleasing to you. We know that we are beautiful in your sight and very soon, dear Father, we'll be in that new system of things. We'll be uh, really benefited from all the kingdom blessings which are going to be showered upon your people globally enabling us to attain to perfection. And that's when, dear Father, at the end of the thousand years, you'll have people uh, that are truly beautiful in your sight because they will have attained to perfection and have the prospect of living forever. So, dear Father, we thank you so much uh, for the timely reminders we're getting through your organization at this time, how important it is that we feed ourselves spiritually, that we avail ourselves of all the provisions you're making, uh, that we can uh, survive 
the end of this system of things, which is now so close. So, dear Father, we'd like to thank you for inviting us along this evening, and uh, please accept our thanksgiving as we offer it to you, as always, from our hearts and in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.